Hello, everyone. It's good to see you all here. Good to invite everyone to this space. I'm the Reverend Jill Olds, the director of the Yale Youth Ministry Institute here at Yale Divinity School. The YMI is very pleased to welcome all of you to today's event, which is entitled, The Storm Isn't Over, Ways to Support the Social Emotional Needs of Youth with Dr. Sahoy Lee. This is our first gathering for this year's YMI Lunch Lab series, and it's our first ever hybrid offering. So with that in mind, I invite you to dig deep with me into the recesses of your hearts, and please extend to us every grace possible. We have a lot of shifting pieces today uh, from folks we are welcoming in person with various COVID protocols to folks we are welcoming online with Zoom and recordings and all sorts of things. And we are facilitating a program in which we are attempting to live out our welcome and sense of inclusion that we espouse at the YMI. So if something goes poorly, please do let us know that, but grace would be much appreciated as well. And thank you all for being here and joining us on this journey. We have people from across the country. We even have some siblings from other regions of the world joining us today. Welcome to those of you coming from afar. We are delighted to bring you here to YDS, to this time and space. To those who have joined us in person, we are so glad to be able to welcome you to campus. If this is your first time here, a special welcome to you from the Yale community. We hope you enjoyed your lunch. A brief uh, to-do or a brief uh, housekeeping item that restrooms are located just outside this door if you go down the hall to the right. And if you need an elevator, it is over to the left. For our time today, Dr. Lee will speak to us and then we'll have a brief workshop time where folks in person and online will split into smaller groups to work through some questions. We'll conclude by coming back into the larger group for a recap and a final Q&A time. For folks who are online, we ask that you please remain muted during your session, but we'll also be monitoring the chat window. So if you have a question, type it in there and we'll be sure to get to it. Our office has a wonderful staff and I'd like to introduce them quickly and thank them for their work. The Youth Ministry Institute falls under the purview of the Center for Continuing Education here at YDS. So Kelly Morrissey is manning staffing our, uh, reser our reservation, yeah, uh -huh. our registration table upstairs. Uh, those of you in person met her before. And we're blessed to have Megan Lukens uh, running the tech for us as our communications coordinator. So thank you to our staff for what they do and more importantly for who they are. If you are new to the Youth Ministry Institute, we invite you to peruse our website when you get a chance. That is YaleYouthMinistryInstitute.org. We have a whole array of resources on there. We have curricula for your youth, training modules for youth leaders. We have discussion forums, over 1,000 video clips and lectures given by world experts in youth ministry. We have pandemic resources. We have tips for working with youth around anti-racism work, mission work, outreach events, links to other articles and materials. All of our offerings are available for free, so please do feel free to check out our website. We also would like you to mark your calendars for our upcoming events. Our next offering for this school year will be on Wednesday, October 5th. Uh, same setup here, 11.30 a.m. for lunch, 12 p.m. for our learning time, at which time we will welcome Dr. Kate Ott. Dr. Ott will be presenting on talking about sex, tech, and faith with teenagers. A link to that registration for folks who are joining us remotely can be found on our website, in our email newsletter, and in your chat window. Please also set aside Wednesday, November 2nd. We will welcome Dr. Eric Carter from Vanderbilt University to our campus. Dr. Carter has unique insight on inclusion for youth who are neurodivergent or for youth who have disabilities. So please do join us online or in person for either of those events as you are able. And now, without further ado, it's my deep pleasure to introduce all of you to Dr. Lee. Dr. Sahoy Lee currently serves as the Director of Counseling and Psychological Services at Phillips Exeter Academy, providing individual psychotherapy, crisis intervention, triage, and short-term skills groups training to boarding and day students. A clinical psychologist with over a decade of research and experience with young people, 
particularly those in boarding school populations. Dr. Lee holds an appointment as a clinical instructor at Harvard Medical School and was the inaugural course director of the Multicultural Training Seminars at McLean Hospital. As if that were not enough, Dr. Lee routinely provides workshops in the treatments of anxiety disorders, both locally and internationally, most recently conducting trainings for parents and clinicians in China and Japan. Dr. Lee, welcome. We are really honored to have you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Reverend Olds. Uh, my name is Sohoi Gui, and you know, it's always strange to hear bio read about you. You think, gosh, this is so weird. And you realize, well, you wrote it, and you gave it to them to read, so <laughs> then it makes it even more awkward. Uh, but it's so um, such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. This is my second time presenting for Yale Youth Ministry, and thank you for the invitation, and this time in person. So I'm really, really excited. And I'm really excited about this hybrid model that we are um, having, and welcome all of you who are joining us remotely. I want to provide a little bit of backstory to all of you of how this presentation came about today and set the stage for our conversation today. A few months back, Reverend Olds gave me a call and we had a nice conversation and one of the questions that she had for me was, what are you seeing with our young people? What are they experiencing? What are you noticing? And how do we best support them? And I, you know, gave that some thought, of course. And I find myself, when I'm asked such questions, to very quickly say, well, since the pandemic, and I fill in the blanks of all that I'm, uh, I'm observing. And over time, I'm having to catch myself a little bit and say, wait a minute. Am I implying that all of what we're noticing is because of the pandemic? And I realized, no. Folks, what I'm gonna to talk to you all today is some of what we're seeing with our young people and what they need from us hasn't changed. It's been the same. It's been the same needs that they've had and it's the same ask that they have of us even prior to the pandemic. I think what the pandemic has done is highlight the need, exaggerate the need, and put it more up front in our faces. But some of the needs that our, our youth is communicating with us have been around for quite some time. And I invite all of us today to think about going back to the basics, going back to the fundamental principles and, and needs, if you will, that our young people are asking us to provide. It's nothing new. It's nothing that you haven't already done or are doing right now or heard of, but it's just reminding us that when things are getting complicated, it's often nice to go back to the basics. And so I'm gonna be talking with you a little bit about that today. Before I do, I do wanna just note, these last two years, two and a half years, it's been kind of a doozy for most of us, right? Um, it's been really hard, pandemic being one of the reasons why the last couple of years have been particularly challenging. And, I, and those of you that have heard my talks before know that I love this imagery and I share it again with all of you today, is really recognizing that yes, while all of us, has, all of us have gone through the storm together, in fact, the storm has impacted all of us in different ways. And so when you're working with young people, it is important to check in, what has this been, what has this been like for you? and allow them to define to you what it's been like and to not make any assumptions and not to make any judgments just by face value. Yes, everybody's been online learning. Yes, everybody's done some sort of hybrid, you know, but beyond that, how has this individual been impacted? How has their family unit been impacted? It's important to ask follow-up questions. And I won't ask all of you to think to respond now but it might be good for you to take a moment of self-reflection of what has it been like for you? Are you someone who has been really well resourced and was able to stand all the bumps and waves and along the, uh, uh, during the storm? Or are you, in moments, this was me, <laughs> this poor little guy <laughs> in a canoe just trying to stay above water, right? What has this been like for you? So let me take a moment and do a little bit of a temperature check of what am I observing in, my, in the clinical world where I am that our youth is um, experiencing right now? 
And again, I underscore some of what I just said, which is a lot of what we're seeing from young people is what what happens in teenage years. Let's put a t time frame around that. We're talking age 13, 14 to about 18 and 19. So I work in a boarding school, and that's around the age range of our students, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. So we're talking about you know, 13 to 19, we have a PG year, so some kids are coming a little older. But think about that age, that phase of their lives. A lot happens. The primary objective of young adulthood is trying to figure out who they are in relation to their parents, in relation to their peers, but really trying to figure out who am I, right? So in this age group, they're trying to different things out, they're experimenting with um, different experiences, they're getting to know different parts of themselves, they are you know, meeting new people, they're dealing with emotions, so all the stuff we've already known. This is not new, this is not because of the pandemic. This is just young people being young people with a lot of raw, big emotions and a ton of passion, right? This is why we love working with them. But what we've noticed is that all that we would expect, anxiety, depression, eating disorder, self-harm, even suicidality, things that we see have just gone up, okay? And this is not a statistics that's exclusively to where I'm working, but this is nationwide, nationwide data that I'm sure all of you have seen already. Again, I think the storm that we've been in the last couple of years have just exacerbated uh, th uh, those observations. Well, we're noticing that our young people are, are a little more emotionally fragile than perhaps the past. And I'll be, I'll be a little bit more specific. Again, I work in a high school. And what my colleagues and I have observed in the last couple of years, you know, I'm thinking about incoming freshmen, ninth graders, 14, 15 year olds. And we've noticed in the last couple of years that there's been a lot more social conflicts, interpersonal conflicts, conflicts that we just don't usually see in high school. And we joke and we say, this is so middle school drama, <laughs> right? We are seeing middle school drama in high school. Why? And then you step back and you say, oh, what was the last two or so years been like for this ninth grader? Seventh grade, eighth grade, and for some, even sixth grade, have been some sort of remote learning, hybrid learning, school shutdowns, isolations, right? Lots of people are nodding. Everybody in online, everybody's nodding in the room, so you should nod too. <laughs> so you know, right? So sixth, seventh, and eighth grade have been interrupted. Middle school is supposed to be messy anyway, right? And I don't know, I hated my middle school experience. It was just a hot mess. Why? Because we're all trying to do this interpersonal relational thing with one another. And the thing of it is, is that our high schoolers missed out on some of those learning opportunities that they would have worked out in middle school. And now they're bringing it to high school. Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of middle school drama in high school. We're seeing students who are just not as socially skilled to interact with one another, not as socially skilled to share space with one another and know how to negotiate their needs, and young folks who are just having a harder time even talking about their feelings and knowing how to regulate those feelings. I can't do a temperature check about the students if I don't always also think about the parents. I don't know about you, <laughs> but the last few years, I am experiencing a different type of parenting. <laughs> the experiences that we are having, with observations of, of, of adults who are dropping their kids off to boarding school and high school, is it's a little different. What do I mean by that? Uh, we're seeing more of, of parents really um, being involved. <laughs> Is that a kind way to say it? Very much involved, so much so that it blurs a little bit of intrusive involvement. And what do I mean by that? Never before have I heard so many students tell me, my parents track my location. And we now have devices, right, that allow us to have that kind of accessibility to one another. Never before have I heard students say, my parents check my emails. And so when you write to me, Dr. Lee, just know that Mom and dad may be writing, you know, my parent may be reading as well. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting phenomenon. Well, we've also noticed that parents are just kind of showing up on campus. 
Yeah, we've had parents who just kind of show up, pop in, check in on their kid. Right? They tell me that they're studying. I want to make sure that they are. They tell me they, they're at a swim practice. Just want to make sure that they're there. I just want to make sure I know where my kids are and I want to be able to be involved. So much so, we even had a parent hold study sessions on campus without us knowing because that parent wanted to make sure that, that their child was keeping up with math, the class that they were struggling in the moment. And so dad was coming up on campus. And we're talking driving, up, not just down the street, right? We're talking, you're driving a couple hours to check in with the daughter about math homework and now because they're doing homework with their friends, now we got a study session going on. This is a level of involvement that we're seeing some of our parents uh, uh, demonstrating. And as a clinician and as a parent myself, I ask, why? Why are we seeing this? And why are we seeing even some hostility coming at us educators, coming at us supporters from folks who signed up for us to care for their children. <laughs> so this is confusing to me. Why? And you know what I think it is? Fear. I think it comes from a space of fear. Parents really afraid that their child can, um, cannot keep up with the demands, right? Fear that they, as a parent, have not done enough for their children, of their child, the last several years. Again, the context, right, the last several years. And there's some compensation that parents are trying to do to make up for what they perceive was lost or what actually was lost because of the last several years. So my previous slide, the temperature check on the youth, is connected to the, my temperature check of the parents. Right? These are kids who 6th, 7th, or 8th grade have been home a lot. So that level of supervision became something that the family has gotten used to. So then when we send them off to high school, there's a little bit of adjustment that needs to happen. You've heard of um, describing parents as helicopter parents. You've heard that before? Yeah, they kind of hover, you know, kind of check up on you, right? What I'm describing is what I call bulldozer parents. <laughs> oh no, they're not just hovering. They're trying to clear the path for their young person, yes? Why? There's such fear that, well, I don't want, you know, who would, as parents, that's our job. Our job is to protect our children. Our job is to care for and to provide for. So it really pulls for us to do that. I don't want my child to struggle. I don't want my child to feel disappointed or be hurt or be sad, right? So I'm gonna pave the way. And also, if I believe that the last couple years have been a doozy for all of us, I'm gonna wanna make sure that my child is ready to keep up with their peers. And so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, right, clear some of that path. And this is when we see things like parents emailing teachers, how dare you give my child this grade? You know, what do you mean they didn't participate? Right? And educators, again, I'd be curious if that's your observation as well, but we're seeing more of that now. Where, where, where I stand, and I think there's a reason why. So I bring us back to the context. Well, what, what's been happening? And I'm very intentional to put COVID-19 at the very bottom of this list of factors, because I don't think it's just a pandemic. <laughs> I, I think part of what we're experiencing and noticing is all that our young people are, 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 are having to deal with, social media being one of them. Right? In the last few years, we have seen a dramatic increase in the presence of social media, and our young people are most vulnerable to that. Right? Not only presence, and, and social media can be a nice tool. We are, most of us are on social media. Many of you found out about the event of today because of social media, so social media can be a very useful tool. But it becomes complicated when it starts to define for us what life is and define for us things like what success should look like, beauty should look like, um, you know, happiness should look like. And that's where I think our young folks are most vulnerable about. And, and you might, you know, I, I ask you to kind of go back to your experiences working with young folks. What are you hearing from them? And my guess is that there's a lot of them being influenced by the influencers, now there's a name for those folks, right? And not just the YouTubers, but the influencers who are trying to say, this is the kind of reality that you too can have. Really? I don't know. 
right? So there's this perceived reality that they need to achieve and what that connects with is a very narrow definition of success. And there's no better example of that than thinking about the college pressure, the college process. More and more I'm meeting young folks who aren't even in high school yet talking about how they're gonna get to the college of their choice. That pressure is so big. <laughs> You know, and I see some of the reactions in the room, I think you're hearing it too. And that folks have this pressure of feeling like there's only a one way of success, there's only one ticket to success and it has to look like this. Well, what happens if it doesn't work out exactly how you envisioned it? Because you know, life kind of happens that way. Couple with fragility emotionally, lack of skill sets, now it's this giant storm of struggle. And we can't also deny what we've been able to witness because of social media, because of media in general, of all the social injustices around the world. And again, social injustices have been going on for a long time, <laughs> not just the last two years. What we've been able to see, though, is more of because of the videos, because of the pictures, because of social media. And what the impact is, is a lot of not only direct, but also vicarious trauma. And, and there's a little sensationalizing that can happen with various news sources that really, for young folks, is hard to get away from, uh, and especially for those who are directly impacted. So this is the context where our young people are growing up right now. <laughs> why would we be surprised that we're seeing what we're seeing with our young people? Things that we were supposed to see anyway, but much, much more, right? So I'm gonna shift my conversation with you all. So that was my temperature check. That's kind of my observations, right? And now let's shift to, well, now what do we do? Okay, so wait, that's great. That's, you know, you really bring lots of joy here. Like, thanks. <laughs> and the way to pipe up the room, Sohoi. But now what? I invite us all to think about the basics. What is it that young folks need from us in order to provide conditions in which they can thrive? There are four that I'm gonna share with you today. But first of all, I'm gonna share with you the prerequisite of it all, okay, which is a safe space. If a young person does not feel safe in your presence and does not see you as a trustworthy person, an affirmative person, and somebody who's support and care and love is predictable, the rest of the conditions will be really hard to come by. Okay. So I think about all of you and the spaces you have created for young people. And my sense is they know they can come to you. They know that you will be there and they know that you will listen. And over time, you've proven yourself to have these basic prerequisites, right? So kids keep coming back. <laughs> That's like the best uh, show of, okay, we're doing something right. They keep coming, right? And I think about parenting, and sorry if I use a lot of examples by my own children, but I'm a mother of two. I have a six-year-old and a three-and-a-half-year-old. And nothing reminds me more about the importance of safe space than dealing with my children. <laughs> and I'll give you an example. Um, my little girl, she's three-and-a-half, and my, every day she gifts me with a kind reminder of mom, you're my safe person. And it goes something like this. When I pick her up from daycare, she runs into my arms. Mommy! Great, magical Hallmark moment, right? She, I hold her, it's great. The teacher saying she had a great day, she did good, she napped, she ate, she played well. Have a good day, we'll see you tomorrow. Then something starts to happen between me walking out of that classroom to my car and drive home, which is seven miles from daycare. <laughs> Some of you are laughing because you know where I'm going with this. I don't even know who I picked up, but she had morphed into somebody very, very different. <laughs> like, scary different, okay? Like, she is just a puddle of emotions. She is not listening. We're demanding snacks and the right one in the right color bowl in the right 
quantity five minutes ago, mom, right? And you just think like, how, this is the wrong kid, right? And in those moments, I have to chant, safe person, safe person, safe person, safe person, safe person, <laughs> to remind myself why this is happening. All the parents in the room, you're laughing, you know this. She's doing this because she did have a fantastic day at school. She did all that she needed to do to follow rules, to self-regulate, to do all the things. She had a great day, just like the teacher said. They weren't lying, right? And now she can go, ah, mommy, because she know it's okay. And that space allows her to be that way. And so I chant, <laughs> safe place, safe place, as I'm trying not to drive off the car. <laughs> But it's moments like that, and I think our young people need that from us, to know that they can go about the world however they need to, but when they are in your presence, they get to do a little bit of <sighs> For young people who have had to do a lot of code switching in different arenas of their lives, how exhausting that can be for them. And in your presence, they can just go, Condition number one, permission to feel like my little Emma. She feels it all with me in those seven mile drive. It's like the longest seven miles ever. <laughs> but they need to know because now you're trusting, you're predictable, you're there, right? You're validating, affirming that they can feel their feelings with you. And it's important that in those moments that you give them a very clear message about feelings is that they're okay to have to be had. Whatever the rainbow of emotions you're experiencing, it's all right. Let's feel them. Let's talk about them. We can contain and hold them. You even see my arm going like this, right? And I often tell young people, look, listen, your emotions are right here, like kind of neck down, right, right here, okay? You own it. It's in your body. Even though at times it feels like it's going to come out and attack you from the outside, no, 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 it's right here. So what we have to get good at is figuring out how to regulate this, right? Emotions are information that our body is giving us. And it's our job, and especially human beings, we have this evolved brain, right? To use this brain to interpret what those feelings are and what is our body trying to tell us and do something about it, which we'll get to next. But it is important for young folks to hear from us that it is okay for you to have these feelings and I'm gonna sit with you and hold you with it while you ride out the wave. And that's another thing that I often talk about emotions is kind of like just waves crashing down um, by the beach and it feels like it's gonna wash over you but it always subsides, always, always, always. So you ride out the wave, you surf out the wave, whatever, how you want to talk about it with young people. But it gives them a, a sense of a visual almost of, okay, my, what is my job right now? I'll give you a little more concrete example. When I'm dealing with someone who has extreme anxiety, in that moment, I, you know, and I, you teach folks, and you often teach them when they're not in a moment of crisis, because in the moment of crisis, they can't hear anything. So before the moment of crisis, you teach them things about emotions and teach them things, feelings like anxiety. And you said, okay, rate your anxiety zero to 10. Where are you right now? Zero being not anxious at all. Ten is I'm about to have a panic attack. Where are you? How do you know? Where do you feel it? Okay, where does it show up in your body? Everybody's a little different. And your job in the moment of crisis, your job is wherever you are to go down one notch. So you're at an eight. Your anxiety is an eight out of 10. Your job right now is to bring it down to a seven. Where at a seven? All right, let's try six. And now six is already feeling subjectively different than eight. Is anxiety gone? No, but maybe a little bit more tolerable. I think with young folks, and sometimes I blame social media, um, there's this need to fix, a need to have, a need to, right, right now, a need to correct. There's this quick need. I will, very, very impatient as a society. And part of that would come with emotions too. We expect emotions to come and go. And so kids get frustrated when they're dealing with anxiety. Anxiety's not going away. Make it stop, make it stop. No, we're just gonna make it smaller. Right? 
So permission to feel, understanding what emotions are, and that your job now is to regulate. I had to put this up here, and I, and I you know, wanted to say that we have to stop saying things like pre-pandemic or let's get back to normal. And I just want to pause, and I'm not going to ask, it's just because the model that we have right now, what, what do you, what do, why? why? Why is that important? It implies right now is abnormal. Right? Well, pre-pandemic, we used to do it this way, not like this. Right? Well, we're, we're going to get back, we're, you know, it'll get better. We're going to get back to normal. But what both of those messages imply is that right now is not okay. And that's not where our young people need to hear from us. And you all work with teenagers. You know they have two time frames, now or later. <laughs> and when they're in front of you, there's a lot of now that needs to get addressed, yes? Right? And so when you say to them, oh, honey, it'll get better, <laughs> that is not helpful, right? And what you're saying to them is right now it's not okay. Okay. You with me so far? So we got to create this condition of allowing folks to feel. And then condition number two, which I think is really, really important, is permission to act. Do something. Do something about those emotions. Do something to regulate those emotions. Go and experience. What I've seen with young folks is this desire to make the emotions go away, the negative ones, right? Make the negative emotions go away right now. And you see folks trying to do that. And it, it, it often shows up in short-term fixes, quick fixes, right? Avoidance works really well, <laughs> right? Um, but the problem with that is what? You're not learning how to regulate. You're not learning how to surf the wave. You're just avoiding the beach altogether, right? So what we have to teach young people is you have to go and experience. You have to go and try to bring it down from an eight to a seven to a six. And for some people, it's reading a book. For some people, it's some meditative work. Some, for some people, it's listening to music. For some people, it's having a good conversation with you, right? Define what that looks like for any one individual. And it's important to build mastery experiences. What do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. Um, I'm an aunt of four. And very recently, over the summer, my niece and nephew came to visit. They're from California, and they came to stay with us for about um, three, four weeks. And one night, we were ready to call for, to take out, um, to order something. And my 13-year-old nephew says, oh, yeah, you know, I'll just order online. They're so quick with their, <laughs> I'll just order this, you know? And I was like, just call. And you should have looked at the way he looked at me. Like, what do you mean you just call? Is that a New Hampshire thing? Like, <laughs> like this is what New Hampshire people do? You know, we Californians don't do that, like, right? And I'm thinking, just call, call. And, it, and we were, you know, we have this relationship where we can have fun with it, but it became this experiment, this teaching moment, if you will, from, you know, New Hampshire auntie of like, it's not just a New Hampshire thing that we call. You need to learn how to dial a phone, <laughs> you know, and like call and place an order. And he did. But we, I had to coach him, and I couldn't believe that I had to do this. You enter the phone. When they pick up, you say, hello. They might ask you, is it delivery or take? Right? You coach them, and he's thinking, oh, my God, this is the craziest thing. But you coach them, and he was able to, and we ended up getting our food success. But that might be an easy moment to have just say, yeah, sure, 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 just online order. But think about this young man who someday may have to call and make a doctor's appointment for himself or needing to call for an emergency or needing to call for something, right? And sure, it's just, it was just takeout, but the skills in which he learned in that moment can be extrapolated in other areas of his life and something that I know firmly that he can draw upon later in his life. But it's mind-boggling to me that a 13-year-old couldn't pick up the phone to make things, to order something, and that it was emotionally challenging. <laughs> I'm thinking, do you remember the days with the, you know, you go like this with the phone? <laughs> you know, see, I'm among friends. All right, so part of why I think what we need to do for young people is allow them to feel and inviting them to act. You got to experience, you got to try. Bulldozer parents, listen up. Stop it. 
you are robbing your young person an opportunity to learn something that they will figure out. You did trust in the child that you've raised. But by you clearing the path every single time, you're actually robbing them experiences of mastery. So stop it. <laughs> Third condition, this all builds. You see where I'm going with this, all right? You gotta feel, you gotta act, and you gotta recover. This is one thing that I think we are terrible at, is that we do not make it our business to make sure we rest. And I mean rest, not multitasking while you're laying in bed rest, right? Not driving, but listening to all your voicemails and answer and dictating back all the, no, 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 no. Like just to be and to rest and to restore. And I especially underscore the importance of this when we're working with the young folks, because I think sleep is one of the first things that go out the window. Number one, they have kind of a different sleep clock than us adults. They tend to trend on a later end. We know that. But we also know that there are a lot of things keeping them awake <laughs> and up and entertained and engaged. And everything's very special and important right now. Remember the two time frames? Now or later. There's no, I can't respond to this tomorrow. Are you kidding me? I gotta do this today. But when I work with young folks and we're talking about a crisis moment, oftentimes my first question is, when was the last time you slept? Followed by, when was the last time you eaten something? Right? And it's all, always the case. They have not slept. Part of my job is to, is to, to respond to crisis 24-7. Um, we kind of rotate those duties. And I can't tell you how many times a crisis was resolved by just tucking that kid in and saying, You're, you know, let's take your device. Let's do, do lights out, let's get into a routine, and we're gonna, you know, night routine, get your pajamas, brush your teeth, blah, blah, blah. Go to bed, and I'll see you in the morning. And it's a completely different child that you spoke to the night before, all dramatic and big feelings and everything has to be now, right? Love them, teenagers. And the next day when they're like, oh yeah, no, it's not that big of a deal, it's all right, I know what to do now. They know. <laughs> They, you know, oftentimes they know what they need to do. They just can't access that in the moment of exhaustion. So I think it's important for us to think about how are we creating and giving permission to rest in a given day? And young folks always tell me things like, well, I'll just catch up on my sleep on the weekends. Or I'll just sleep all day Saturday. And it, they do. <laughs> but, you know, I'll sleep all day Saturday or Sunday. But what we know about sleep and restoration is it doesn't work that way. Our body does not say, Okay, but we'll get to sleep on Saturday. Let's go, right? Whatever negative impact that sleep deprivation, deprivation give us happens in real time. So it's a little bit of withdrawing from the bank, thinking that, well, I'll just make a big deposit in the weekend. Well, you may still be in the red, and it doesn't really work out that way because the withdrawals were happening in real time, right? So making sure that there's time to rest and restore. Um, and if you haven't heard of Dr. Ben Shahar, I invite you to think of, uh, to look into his work. And he has this wonderful book called Happier um, No Matter What. And it's a great read, and I invite you to, to look into his research. And, and I recently went to a talk that he, he did, and I love what he said, which is stress is not the problem, it's a lack of recovery. It's okay to be busy. Remember, the other condition was just permission to act. It's okay to be busy. It's okay to have a lot of structure in your day and to have a lot of things that give you passion and joy. And the problem is, is that we don't have time to rest. And what Dr. Ben Shahar talks about is inviting us to go away from this model of um, just talking about resilience. And the way that we think about resilience, I'm gonna use this little rubber band, is can you withstand hardship? Can you go through things in your life, being stretched and turned and whichever way and kind of remain your form, right? No matter how I stretch this, it kind of goes back to its original form. Right? And what he's inviting us to think about is not so much that, but more of anti-fragility. That is not about going back to your original form, but do you get better and stronger because of. And if we think about muscle building, that's exactly what happens. When you go and work out, right? You're essentially breaking down muscle tissue and you're expecting to rest and recover 
for that muscle to grow and be better and bigger than before. And that's what he talks about anti-fragility, which has been really, re it resonates with me a lot because I, I think we have gotten into space of, you know, can you put up with life? Okay, good job, it didn't break you. But hardship and challenges and life experiences calling for takeout is something that will not only be something you can withhold, you can actually be better because of. And that's what we should be inviting our young people to think about. That it's not about stress, it's not about adversity, it's not about challenges, but it's about what do you do with it and if you allow yourself time to rest. And folks, rest, I don't just mean sleep. I mean time to reflect, right? Time to journal, to write, to, well, however reflection might look like for someone's practice but really getting in touch with that part of themselves to say, whoa, what was that about? What was that like? And having time to debrief with themselves. And the last permission is to permission to give. There's been a lot of research coming out from, well, Yale, <laughs> um, and um, UPenn and all over the, uh, the country about what is happiness and how do you measure happiness? And what we're finding, what we're learning, is that self-compassion is a skill, is a practice that really will help foster a sense of happiness, as well as gratitude and ability to give and to be service of. I love this, um, uh, this research example that came out of Penn's um, Authentic Happiness Research Lab. And they gave one group of people, uh, so they divided their participants into two groups. And one group got, let's say, $100. And their goal, their job was, go and buy something for yourself with this money. And when you come back, we're gonna measure your happiness, okay? The second group got the same amount of money and their instruction was, we need you to go and buy something for somebody else and give it to them. And when you come back, we're gonna measure your happiness. What do you think happened? Who was happier? The givers. What they found was that the givers had more sustained happiness. What do I mean by that? That there was a burst of joy and happiness when you got something fun for yourself, and then it kind of goes away, <laughs> okay? Until the next big purchase. And I think about my kids going to Target, and they're like, oh my God, I need to have this right now. And then they haven't looked at it since we've been home. You know, like <laughs> that. But when you're able to give, and when you're able to practice things like gratitude and giving, that there is joy that you experience immediately, but also that joy you get is longer lasting, is something that holds you a little longer than just a quick spike for yourself. And I ask, how much do we give our, our, our young people permission to do that as part of their life, to do that as part of their daily routine or part of their weekly routine or their monthly routine? Right? To not only give to themselves, giving themselves permission to have grace and to be flexible and be kind, but also to give that to other people as well. So I started out this talk kind of, you know, grim. <laughs> and I realized as I was looking at my title, I'm like, gosh, so hey, couldn't you come up with something a little bit more uplifting? But yes, folks. I, I certainly don't believe that the storm is over. I, I don't think this was the storm. I think we've had plenty of others along the way, and yet the last two years we've had this big um, combination of various storms. The storm is not over, but what we also know is that at the end of every storm is a rainbow. And so I leave that with all of you to think about how do we take a moment to reflect on what's all taken place, uh, and how do we create these conditions of thriving for our young folks? Uh, and, and that's what we're going to be working on <clears throat> in, our, in our small group. I think I'm right on target with time, but folks can tell me if otherwise. But So I believe all of you on online will be broken into small groups. All of us here will break, will, will come together. And I have a couple exercises for us to work on in these small groups. You all gather. Um, online, we'll gather here, and then we're all gonna come back together again before we close out with the Q&A. Thank you all very much, and have fun in your small groups.
folks, thanks for the, the small group breakouts and thanks especially for those who are on Zoom for your patience. My understanding was you got the prompt but then it went away really quickly. So I'm sorry about that. We will, we are a work in progress today but thank you for, for the discussion you did have. Dr. Lee is going to introduce one more slide and then we'll enter into Q&A time and some time of reflection from the groups. Uh, for folks who are online, I'm still in that chat. If you have questions, throw them in the chat window and I will bring them to our room here. Thanks. Hello again, everyone. Hopefully you found your small group conversations to be productive, helpful, affirming. Um, I know I really enjoyed our small group conversation and felt very inspired by all the great work that folks are already doing in their the corners of the world that they are. So it's quite lovely to, to gather again. You know, some things that came up as I was listening to some of our conversation, I just want to remind folks that, you know, these are conditions. They're not, um, they don't, they're all interconnected. It's not necessarily that they're building off of one another. What do I mean by that? I think it's important that we um, give folks permission to feel and to rest and to act and to, it's not just you only worry about one thing at a time. I think it's important that all those conditions are being considered whenever you're doing any program design or any um, rolling out of, of approaches of engagement. So just a quick reminder of that. And I'll tell you my pet peeve. My pet peeve is when organizations or institutions create lots of space to allow for feelings. Because I think we all have gotten that. People need to be able to feel, right? But what I worry a lot about is when we only do that, <laughs> when we only create space to feel, but there's no follow-up plan. And when done in such a way, it can actually be dangerous that you're inviting folks to open up all their feelings with no clear plan of what you're going to do with it. And that's, to me, irresponsible. And so if you're thinking about holding feeling spaces, open forms to so just come in and holding spaces, wonderful. Please also build in the permission to act part, right? Is that when the feelings get so big and they're now sharing, and then what? Who's there to help them with the regulation? Who's there to give them some skill sets of what to do? Otherwise, you're just leaving the kids hot and dry on their own with a bunch of feelings and what they might experience is this is hard with no purpose other than to just the right and they're less likely to want to engage in that exercise again so I think a lot about how we need to be responsible when we're inviting folks to do these things with us um, and that we're setting them up for success we're allowing them to feel to act to rest and to reflect and regroup so that this all needs to happen at the same time finally I invite all of you to think about how are you doing? <laughs> you, 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 you in the back, right? In a very trauma-informed lens, we know that in order to help those in need, the helpers have to be okay. And I think about all of you in the room, I think about all of you online, and as I said, it's a clinical term, I swear. It's been a doozy of a few years. <laughs> <laughs> how have you been? How are you taking care of yourselves? And we know we can't pour from an empty cup. How's your cup? Is it cracked? Is it, right? Like, what is it that you need to do? And again, giving permission to make sure you're okay and that your cup, so there are other ways you're filling your cup now before you're pouring out because you can actually do more harm. You can actually do more harm as a helper if you're, you, you yourself are not okay. Going back to an example as a parent, my most low moments as a parent the last several years, the ones that I hope nobody was watching and listening, were the moments when I was not okay. I was frustrated. I was tired. I was scared. I was feeling af afraid or alone, right? And those are the moments that my best parenting skills did not come out. I probably could have done a how not to traumatize your kid, you know. So again, reflecting back, right, those weren't about the kids. Those were about me. And so as helpers, I invite all of you to think about taking a moment and give yourselves permission to take care of yourselves. And those of you that have heard my talk before, I always talk about tap in and tap out. 
as helpers, we need to lean on our community of other helpers. And all of you are coming today with a group that you're representing. And many of you, there's several of you from the group here today. Lean on one another. There may be a time when you need to tap out. Doesn't mean you're out of the game. You just need to, need to tap out for a minute. You tap in your friend. You tap in your colleague. Who's going to go and do the good work? And then there may be a time that they need to tap out. Then you're back in. Right? This tapping and tap out system has to work for us for nothing more than sustainability. The type of work that we're doing is hard because we do it with our hearts. And in order for this to be sustainable long term, that then we aren't harmed ourselves in the very end, is we need to be able to give those permissions to ourselves and tap out if we need to. I thank you all very much for your grace to me today and your attentiveness. I hope some of what I've shared today resonates with you and that there's some nuggets that you're able to take back with you. Um, I think the youth that you support are so fortunate to have you in their lives, and I'm just happy our path, path crossed today. And now we'll do some Q&A. Yeah? Thank you. Anybody have any questions or any any comments or thoughts? We've all got this down clearly. Well, I was just going to tell the audience online, everybody's so moved in the room that they're speechless. <laughs> we also just had a great for a small group conversation. Perfect. Perfect. And folks, anyone online, I know uh, I'm, I'm off camera here, but there are some, there's some opportunities. Feel free to jump in the chat. Okay, there is, there is a question from the chat. Uh, one issue that came up was how to destigmatize conversation about mental health. Oh. I always answer, I tend to. My son's learning the words never and always, and <laughs> catching, my, catching me all the time, misusing it. I think we misuse the word mental health. <laughs> Can I just say that? When folks talk about mental health, I think what they mean is mental health disorders or mental health conditions, right? Diagnosable, right? But when I, as a clinician, hear mental health, I think about, how are you? <laughs> how are you doing? Right? We, every one of us, have mental health, just like we have physical health. We have spiritual health. We have financial health. We have, right, that this is just part of the constellation of us as a being, that we all have these areas that we must attend to. We all have mental health. But I think it's misused in a way that people say, well, there's someone with mental health. You know, what's oh, they have mental health issues. And that there's something that is, the connotation is something much more negative. And I'm really trying to help folks understand that we all have to take care of our mental health. And if we do that, we're more likely to not get to the end of the continuum where now our mental health is getting impact, is impacting our functioning, impacting our wellness, impacting us being able to be our best selves. When that's getting in the way, then yes, Right, maybe there's more of diagnosable concern that we need to get treatment and, and so on. But short of that, we're just trying to live life. We're just trying to deal with life and feelings and experiences and we all do that and we all need to take care of that part of ourselves. So I think it's in the language. I think it's in correcting folks saying, oh my gosh, that's my anxiety. Instead of, I'm nervous about that. Right? Oh gosh, I'm so OCD about my notebooks. No, I'm pretty organized about my notebooks, right? We have to correct the way folks use diagnosis in everyday language, because I think it misrepresents what actually is and clouds what is just mental health, our ability to take care of our feelings and emotions and functionality. Thank you. We have another question uh, from online. How can we help parents reduce fears, parents specifically who are bulldozing? How do we help build trust with youth leaders uh, that their youth are in good hands? Remember folks, 
go back to the basics. I think about parents and I think about those prerequisites. Affirm, right? Be predictable and trustworthy to the parent, just like you would with the kids. Same thing. Parents are human as well. So being able to affirm to a parent, I know you're worried. I know you're scared. I know this is hard, right? And just that alone can go a long way. And to say, I'm here, right? As they're dropping off their child at, you know, your church group or your high school or your classroom to say, I'm here. And you and I are gonna stay in communication, right? You can predict that, that I'm gonna have, you know, these weekly office hours or you, you, can, I, you can predict that this is the number you can reach me, this is the email that you can get in touch with me, that we're gonna stay in touch. So it's the basics that you're now offering to the adults. Affirm, validate, hold, um, but also be that trustworthy, predictable source. And then give it time. <laughs> like, trust isn't just given, trust is earned. And so really planting those seeds and know that it's gonna take a few. And that parent may still wanna talk to you a lot. And then over time, it may decrease in frequency as they build that trust with you, that you meant what you said, you, will, you do have their back, you are looking out for their child, and that will come with time. So also be patient. A, a follow-up question to that is, are there specific resources or reading to recommend to parents to help them deal with their fear-driven behaviors, uh, articles or maybe books to read as a group perhaps? Oh gosh, yeah, I'm happy to provide a list of resources. Maybe I'll provide through yeah. you, Reverend Jill, and you yeah, can- Yeah, we can send them along. Send them along. You know, I really recommend for parents to just think about um, books like Dr. Ben Shahar's book about happier. And in there, it talks about these values that we have and that it's a, that's, that's broadening our definition of success. What does successful parenting mean? Right? How do you broaden that example? And you know, in that book, he talks about just be a good enough parent, not a perfect parent. Good enough, <laughs> right? And your good enough is pretty darn good, but it doesn't mean that you don't mess up. And you know, I'll share my again, not to overburden my examples or, or personal examples, but you know, there are times when my children have not seen me at my very best, and that's okay. But it's me circling back to my child and said, yeah, that was not good. <laughs> Sorry, mom kind of lost it at breakfast, right? Then you're modeling from your child that I'm human, I'm gonna lose it just like you do. And we as a family can figure it out and I would come back and I'll apologize and I'll come back and make it right and that we will do better next time. And we literally have these conversations, right? Me, even me, my little three and a half year old girl. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll not yell as much. And mom too, you know, <laughs> like let's do this together. Then it's partnership rather than othering. You need to fix it. So then I will do better. No, 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 that's together, right? Yeah, yeah. This is a, a Tangentially related question, but I think is, is along a similar uh, line of thinking. How do we prepare not only ourselves, but the whole group, say we're in a, a youth group of some sort, for an emotional breakdown, um, for perhaps when you cannot necessarily recover from emotions? Uh, this person writes, you mentioned having an action plan. Are mm -hmm. there resources for emotional first aid that you could recommend? Oh, yes, yeah. Okay, so there's multiple parts to that question. Let me see if I can get them all. If I miss something, please let me know. There are lots of great resources out there, and many of them are free, where you can get you and your team trained for um, emotional first aid, right? How to respond, how to listen, to understand, what happens when there is a need for mental health professionals to get involved, what are their, their local resources. It may be good to just do a training, and many of them are online now, where you and your staff are on some common ground, and you have some common language around how to support youths. As I said before, I think it's important to open up f f spaces for there to be feelings to be shared, um, and make it okay for some feelings to be hard. And I'm really picky about language. 
I wouldn't get on stage and say, all right, folks, we're going to get together and we're going to talk about some hard things. There may be some breakdowns. No, 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 right? Like already the way you frame that is negative. Already the way you frame that is something scary. There's going to be some emotional breakdowns, right? There may be really hard feelings, some that are really hard to withstand and hold by yourselves. If you're finding yourself in those moments, I would like you to reach out to Miss Kelly, who's going to be in the back, and then she'll be able to talk with you a little more. Always make sure that in those moments that you're not the only leader in the group, that you're able to just eyeball somebody, your colleague, cross the room, give them that look, and they know, hey, you got to check on this other child there. And that when they take, take that child to a more private space to talk, that you haven't lost the rest of the room. There's nothing worse than you know responding to a, a, a more uh, challenging situation and then you leave a room with folks who are looking around trying to make sense of it all by themselves. That can be um, quite concerning. So when you're planning such events, make sure that you yourself have backup, you know who you would need to call, you have private spaces to go to, right? So if you're anticipating that there will be some challenging feelings, make sure there's a few more rooms where somebody can kind of just go in and then have more of a private conversation. Know your counseling support. You know, is there one that's associated and affiliated with your um, organization? Is there a local support hotline that you can have access to? If things start to escalate in a way, is there an emergency room that you may need to know? Kind of how do we get this child there? No, do your homework. Don't invite someone to share so openly with you without being ready to catch it on the other end. And if you're not sure, if what all I just said made you really nervous, this may not be the time to hold that space. Or this may be a time for you to tap out and attend to that. What is it that's making you nervous? What is this coming up for you? There may be other things that you have to take a look at. To kind of bear and grit it and, grit and like go for it, you know, can actually backfire. So listen to, listen to your gut. We had a comment in the chat um, that, you know, as, as uh, people of faith, we can also name that God names each child as beloved. And naming each child as beloved allows for the ability, perhaps, to take the anxiety down from an eight to a seven to a six. Mm. And that, that's, a, that's an offering there. Mm. Um, one other uh, question in our, we have just a couple quick minutes. Um, uh, relates to, you had a bullet point up about social injustice. Can you say a little bit more about that and what perhaps social injustice might have, uh, how it might relate and dovetail with this conversation of how youth are struggling right now? Yeah. My quick answer is that the social injustices that we are experiencing and we've witnessed attacks the prerequisite, safety. That young folks are having to question, am I safe? Am I, sa do I, am, am I physically safe? Am I safe in my community, my city, my town, however you, you know, they want to frame their space? But that their safety is called into question. And their identity is called into question. Their skin, their skin color is called into question. I think about kids who are also worried about safety of their family members. I remember when there was a lot of anti-Asian violence um, that a lot of our students who were from inner cities, and th this is a time when we heard a lot of violence in the cities, that they were so worried that they were gonna get a call from home saying somebody, a grandparent was attacked going to the subway, and that this is what they're carrying. And so when you know these social injustices are happening around you and it questions your sense of safety and safety of those you love, it rocks you. I remember what we talked about. It is a fundamental that the other conditions, I believe, build upon. And when that fundamental is challenged, it's quite scary. When we invited our, invited our students back on campus, that was one of the first things that we talked about is, are our students of color, are our queer students, are, you know, are they gonna feel safe on campus, a predominantly white town, right, in New Hampshire? What are some safety cues? What are some conversations we need to be provide our youth so that when they enter our space, again, they can say, ah, instead of still feeling like they have to white knuckle through everything. So that's how I see it all interconnected. Thank you. Any other questions from this group? 
Folks, I want to thank Dr. Lee for her time, and if we could give her a round of applause and thank her.